Hello, and welcome to High Society with Paxton Quigley. Folks, it might interest you that there are now currently 907 cannabis, psychedelic, and drug policy bills, either in some state legislatures and the US. Can you imagine that? 907. I don't know how these legislators are gonna get through it. It might take them nine years the way it's going. Anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting for people to know that um, our, our representatives out there are, are trying their darndest to get uh, legislation and, and everything else passed so that uh, we all can in, enjoy CBD, THC, or whatever, you're, whatever you like. Um, also at the same time, and I think this is important, Democratic Senators Chuck Schumer, Cory Booker and Ron Wyden, they're putting together a federal marijuana legalization bill. Yes, another one. Uh, the goal of the bill is to guarantee social equity in the burgeon burgeoning cannabis industry. That's how they describe it. And at the moment, and this is important and we've talked about it before, only 5% of cannabis companies are owned by people of color. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the same is true a lot with women. So uh, we're, we're down on the scale. With that being said, on March 11th, 2021, a new government cannabis coalition was launched with the goal of, and I'm gonna read this, influencing and advancing a federal policy and creating a framework for legal cannabis regulations. And that sounds like a tall, order, and it's called the Coalition for Cannabis Policy, Education, and Regulation. And it has not only enlisted cannabis policy experts, academics, mental health experts, uh, researchers, it's the usual suspects, but they're all together wanting to make a difference and possibly this time work out some, some good policy for, for, for uh, cannabis. Now, interestingly enough, there's a little twist here. It also includes tobacco and alcoholic companies, as well as several convenience store partners. And I don't know if you know what a convenience store partner is or a convenience store. Those are those little stores that are often on the, the corner of the street where they sell cigars and you can buy chewing gum and, and other goodies uh, out there. So, um, to tell us more about this coalition, uh, which I find really interesting, is Executive Director Andrew Friedman. Many of you may remember Andrew Friedman as Colorado's cannabis czar in 2014. I love that. You were a czar. Well, anyway, he's a Harvard-trained lawyer, and Mr. Friedman was appointed by then Governor John Hickenlooper and he was asked to implement the world's first legal adult use cannabis market in Colorado. So let's see if uh, uh, it's gonna happen uh, with you, Andrew Friedman. Welcome to High Society with Paxton Quigley. It is absolutely my pleasure to be here. I've never gotten a, a more uh, uh, ornate introduction in my entire life. So it is uh, really a ornate. Wonderful way of, ornate. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, I, I'm also impressed that uh, you were at Brookings. My former husband uh, was at Brookings for almost as long as uh, uh, you've been there, or you were there. Uh, he's I, now I think at that, Stanford that was, University. That was, that was my uh, Center of Excellence member, John Hudak, who was at Brookings. I, I, I can't claim that distinction. Uh huh. Well, it's a, 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 great, a great place to be. I, I know that for sure. Now, um, for starters, please tell us a bit more about the coalition. Uh, it's got a long name, and I, I assume that it encompasses a lot. Please tell us. Yeah, so the, the coalition was founded on the idea that um, for the last several decades, we've had a, a real conversation at the federal level of should cannabis be legalized? There was a, a proponents and opponents of legalization. Um, the proponents honestly have done uh, an amazing job at advancing the conversation a, as far as they have. Uh, and, and over the last five or six years, um, really looking at 
how close we're getting to legalization, how serious the conversation is, and in fact, the fact that legalization is a, a basic reality for about a, a third of Americans at this point. Uh, and really thinking through what, how should legalization look rather than simply if legalization is a good idea. Understanding that legalization can look a thousand different ways. Uh, and um, we thought that it would be, uh, there, there was a, a, a space out there to invite people who are for legalization, against legalization, neutral on legalization, but understand that this reality is coming and wanna talk about the best ways to do it that still protect public health, still protect uh, public safety, um, provides the consumer with uh, a safe uh, and responsible um, uh, product, um, still provides patients with uh, the medicine that they need, um, uh, and uh, still provides an, af an a, a continues to, or at least, um, uh, I would say it even expands the social equity models that um, that work uh, becomes a, a, a an avenue to talk about criminal justice, um, but also works on driving all high. And there's these thousands of issues that uh, are coming up every time we talk about legalization, and we wanted to create a space to have that conversation. Let's let's talk about best practices for all major issues about legalization. And that way, when it does come up through Congress for uh, an eventual um, bill, we're able to say, we've covered the biggest issues. Here are the best practices for all of these major issues. Here is um, something we've talked to small businesses about, about a, a to, um, to have a craft um, a space in the market. Um, here is a conversation we've had with highway safety about the best way um, to make sure that we can monitor and, and ensure the streets are safe. And essentially, answer definitively the big questions that need to be answered heading into legalization. Now, do you think that uh, your bill will be a lot different, or I shouldn't say your policy, uh, will be a lot different in what Schumer uh, is going to be proposing? Have you talked with him? So we have not. Uh, we just launched on, on Thursday. So um, uh, we are um, uh, just coming into the space, and we have not had a chance to review uh, Senator Schumer, or Senator Wyden, Senator Booker's bill, um, uh, and it might not be. Uh, and in fact, maybe a lot of the best practices aren't about the bill; they'll be about the regulations or the public education campaigns, or you know, there's any number of avenues that can solve some of these problems. Um, it, it might be that um, we look at the opening bill, and it's already contemplated a lot of what we talk about. Hmm. That's that's very interesting. Um, uh, I found it um, um, surprising as to some of the people who you have on, not because of their uh, n any negativity, but I, I noticed that Shanita Penny, who's formerly with the Minority Cannabis Business Association, is on there, as well as uh, John Hudak of uh, the Brookings Institution, who I know is you know big in marijuana legal policy. How did you get all these different, well-known people together? How did how did that come about? Well, I think they also saw a space for talking about how uh, legalization should pr uh, proceed. Um, I know that Shanita. Um, I've known Shanita for a long time. Uh, I have tremendous respect for the work that she does. Um, and we really talked for a long time about what it meant to be a bridge builder in the space, that, um, that there is um, a certain level of skepticism and, and, and distrust amongst members coming into this space, um, and that we needed the sort of people who could get all the diverse voices into a room to con dis discuss constructively what this all could look like going forward. Uh, I think Shanita welcomed the opportunity of there's some big players, uh, obviously, in, in this coalition, that um, if she can bring the right voices in to help um, create a structure with these big players, that all of these people kind of rowing the same way could be very powerful and get a lot of things done. And so um, I think she enters with uh, a lot of hope, but also that, you know, a realistic eye that she, she has to make sure her voice is heard and that she brings in a lot of the right voices as well. And I think the promise for me is that that is exactly what would happen. Uh, same with John Hudak. I mean, John Hudak has, has a, a sterling reputation um, for uh, someone who puts data, research, science first um, when he comes into an issue. Uh, and that that is um, a, a foot we were really looking to, to lead with uh, as well when we have a national conversation about legalization. Um, 
And, and finally, from, from my point of view, I wanted people whose voices did kind of stop the show and who I knew <laughs> that if we didn't listen to them, they would walk. And, and that's the sort of responsibility we want to have coming in. Otherwise, um, you know, what's, this, what's a center of excellence for, if not um, to really highlight those, um, those kind of top end voices uh, in, in the conversation. So how much influence do you expect the organization will have in, in achieving, you know, the, the coalition's goals? Since, you know, I don't know what they are exactly yet, but do you see how, how will you influence uh, uh, the, 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 the Congress, the Senate, the president, for example? He, he, he himself is not very much of a, shall we say, a pro-cannabis person and as of uh, today he seems like uh, uh, he, that he dislikes it intensely and and I think one of the things we can offer to a lot of those members is what questions and concerns do you have coming in one of the things we hear from the Biden administration um, is uh, a worry about legalization's impact on mental health so okay let's dig into that issue um, where are there uh, potential impacts on mental health um, uh, in what ways would legalization exacerbate those and in what ways could it actually mitigate it and provide the sort of resources for um, prevention and treatment um, uh, in spaces that um, uh, could create a better world than the status quo. I think until we can kind of come to them with that answer and show, actually, we have some ideas on how to make this better than the status quo, um, then it's fair for them to be skeptical uh, of the movement. Um, some of our own members are skeptical until we can come up with those answers. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the truth is that legalization is, is here. Uh, almost everyone we talk to is, you know, it's already legal for 100 million Americans. And if you, you know, read the tea leaves on it, it's going to be 200 million in two years, right? That, um, that it's going to be either state or federal legalization um, at some point. Um, and, and in some way, this will, there will be national legalization. There kind of already is national legalization. So part of what we'd want to bring to senators and to the administration is there's a good way of doing this. Uh, and we should really be discussing that. And it's kind of no longer acceptable to just have the conversation of saying, I'm against it, and therefore I don't want to talk about it. Um, it's here. How are we going to do it the best way possible? What other countries have had success in the legalization process? I know Canada seems to have come a, a long way, uh, yet, it, and it seemed to have happened rather quickly. Can you uh, give us a, an overall of, of the world view of, of legalization? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's it's there's very interesting models in different states about general drug policy. Portugal has some really interesting things going on. Um, uh, you know, obviously the, the Netherlands have always kind of had a, a quasi-legalization approach, uh, but really if you're talking about a tax and regulate system around cannabis. The only country that truly has that at this point is Canada. Um, and I would say um, the, the jury's still out a little bit. You know, the illicit market is still uh, a significant part of the Canadian market going for, uh, uh, at this point. Um, uh, if it manages to over time capture the illicit market, then uh, it's done its job. Um, and and then we start to look at the public health and public safety outcomes over a period of time there. Um, but I, I, I would also um, caution that it was certainly also been a bumpy road for Canada and um, and, and lessons learned, but, but in both directions. Are you going to take any of their ideas since they were successful? Yes, I, I'm, I think we will. Uh, first of all, I've worked for Health Canada um, in, in the past, uh, was a consultant for um, the, the government through um, transition into adult use uh, cannabis, uh, I believe in 2018, um, and uh, have gotten to know the Health Canada people very, very well, uh, and, and um, will absolutely be inviting them in to, to come share their lessons learned um, as they go through this. What about in the area of women in the ca in the, in cannabis? As you know, uh, it's a, a low priority, it seems. And of course, uh, people of color. Uh, what do you see happening in that 
in those arenas, I should say. Yeah, I, I think it, it's pretty clear to me that we need uh, to understand what it takes on a federal level to create the sort of space for small businesses here um, that uh, that will continue to exist, you know, in a world of interstate commerce. Because I think that's a, a open question. People are concerned about it. Uh, and I think will be work that we do right off the bat. Um, and I really will. I mean, those are the places where I'm so thankful to have a Shanita Penny who can um, uh, bring the voices into the room and and help us write out what are the business models that allow for that space to continue? Um, what sort of access to capital needs to exist um, specifically for um, those companies to thrive and what sort of protections against uh, other parts of the regulated industry uh, will they need in order to continue to survive in, in future cycles? Uh, I cannot pretend that I have those answers right now. I think those are really hard questions. Um, uh, but the point of the coalition was to not come with anything fully baked simply because this is the conversation that needs to happen. I find it so extraordinary that there's so many uh, different bills out there. You know, I mean, it's, it includes psychedelics also, but 900 bills? Uh, has that ever happened in, in, in any other situation that you know of? I, you know, uh, it is the watching this industry grow up over the last uh, seven years has been really remarkable. Um, in that it was a thing nobody wanted to talk about forever. And if you brought a cannabis bill into the um, uh, into the legislature, you, everyone was going to kind of laugh behind your back. Uh, and now, if you don't bring a bill, you're kind of not a serious legislator at this point. Um, and uh, uh, I think I think it's the maturing of the industry. A lot of people have a lot of ideas, and now we have to talk about you know what are the actual best ideas, uh, and and how do we create a cohesive strategy moving forward. Now, if we had a crystal ball or you had a crystal ball, uh, what would you say uh, would be happening, let's say, in the next uh, two years, five years? Is, are we going to be, when we walk into a supermarket, there'll be a supermarket just for cannabis? Could that happen? <laughs> I, I tend to think that the way cannabis is going to look is, is going to be a footprint of how it's evolved. So, um, uh, I, you know, I think that states are going to want to continue to have the sort of time, place, manner restrictions that they have created um, over time. And, and this has been something that's existed at a state level will, will probably be a decade before there's even a federal world around it. And so I think that it'll be pretty individual from state to state what you end up seeing. Um, uh, that that it won't be you know a very the, this a wholly unified model uh, uh, across uh, um, uh, the country. Won't uh, that make for complications though? In in just in terms of of transportation and trade and all that, if if we don't have one unified state of laws or something like that. I do think this is going to be a complicated regulatory system, uh, and I think that's in part because of the way that it's been led through you know, a dozen state efforts rather than from, from the federal government down. I think in the absence of federal leadership here, we've really seen the states fill the void and you can't really undo that um, on, the, on the back end. And so I think it'll be, it'll be complicated um, and it'll be different from state to state, um, even with uh, a federal framework that sits on, on top of it. But I do think with the federal framework on top of it, there'll be standards around uh, uh, product safety, testing, labeling, advertising, um, uh, product format, like what, what it is that um, the consumers, um, that it, to, things that ensure that a consumer gets kind of a consistent product, whether they're in California or Florida, um, and that, you know, we can kind of track it all back to its origin. We can make sure that uh, it has all the kind of safety standards that you would consider any other good to have that you can buy. Uh, in the United States. Do you see uh, that a mom and pop dispensary will no longer be around? So what I would say is I, I think there's a huge appetite to have that not happen. Um, and that, you know, specifically when you look at legalization over, you know, what it would take to pass it through, you know, 50 to 60 senators uh, in the United States Senate, that if it would um, be destructive to their own economies that they have back home, 
uh, that that probably won't um, they probably won't vote for it. Um, that said, you know, I think some con consolidation is always going to happen in the market. Colorado's gone through its own consolidation over time, right? That um, uh, there are stages to how how the industry uh, matures. I think there has to be a clear place for mom and pops um, to not only survive but thrive in a legalized market. Or I don't, I don't think people will vote for legalization. Oh, that's interesting. Now I'm going to ask uh, uh, the big question uh, because I know that some people in the cannabis industry are wary of the involvement of big alcohol and big tobacco, and uh, they 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 don't want them in because they're afraid they will take over a good share of the market. Uh, can you um, talk about that? And in terms of the policy that that you're putting together. So when we uh, started implementation in Colorado for the world's first legalized system, we had something called the Amendment 64 Task Force, which the, the whole purpose was to bring all of the, the voices into the room for what it would take to implement this in a way that still protect public health and public safety. And we included industry at the room in the room, which at the time, a lot of our own public health people were saying, don't do that. You shouldn't invite pub industry here. Uh, but our point was, these are all stakeholders in what's going forward. Um, and to cast dispersion on one group or another group and not get their input on what this needs to look like um, and what is both feasible, uh, what will cause complications, um, just invites them to go their own separate route. And so um, having all of these groups come to the table and say, we are interested in hearing how to do this the right way is a good thing. Um, and uh, and that means it's also beholden on us to make sure all the other voices come to the table as well um, to be a part of that conversation. And that's really the space we're looking to hold. Well, I would like to keep talking to you. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I hope to have you back on, let's say six months from now. And so you can give us a report that uh, all is going well and all that you have recommended is, is, is now being uh, finalized in, in, uh, in Congress and, and things are going forth. Uh, so I, I really appreciate uh, the time you've, you've spent with us, Andrew. Uh, and again, uh, he's executive director of the newly formed Coalition for Cannabis Policy, Education and Regulation. And can you give people your website, please? It is cpear.org, cpear, okay. think cpear.org. I much appreciate that you're, you're here with us and taking the time to speak with, with our audience. I know that uh, you probably are getting a lot of people who are wanting to talk with you. So I appreciate that you have time to talk with us. And thank you My very much. My absolute pleasure, Paxton. Thank you for having me. This, this interview with Andrew Friedman and all of our shows can be heard on Apple, Audible, Spotify, Spreaker, obviously Cannabis Radio, and uh, also other podcasts out there, as well as on our website. And I'd also like to thank our listeners who've purchased my latest suspense novel. It's called Just Try Me, and um, it's available on Amazon.com, both in Kindle and hardcover, or I should say softcover, not hardcover. So listeners, please stay safe. 